French had the lead for the longest time, perhaps all the way until World War II. And they competed in a whole variety of ways through organizations that, that were there specifically to teach language to those foreigners, through uh, publishing houses, through, and this is one thing that is not very widely known, but it is true, through news agencies. News agencies which were, existed before the telegraph, their power was greatly amplified. You know, remember what news agencies are, like Reuters, which still exists, and at the time, the Habas, which was the French news agency. News agencies are companies that sell news to newspapers, particularly local newspapers. If you're the New York Times, you probably not, don't need that much uh, you, uh, uh, stuff from the news agencies because you have your own team of reporters, a large team of reporters who, create, who go out there and actually witness the, 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 the events or make the interviews and come back with original news. But if you're a local newspaper in a small state in the United States or a local newspaper in Mexico or, or a local newspaper in, in, in Europe, you need to buy the services of the news agencies. So news agencies, using the telegraph as a, as, a, as a magnifier, as an amplifier, began to output tremendous amounts of this material language day <coughs> after day after day. And this is why in the battle for, to become the international standard, French, the French and the English backed up their news agents, the agencies. Russia now has created its own news agents, or not now, but you know, a, a few decades ago. China has now its, its own news agency because they are perfectly aware that letting other people with foreign languages have their, a monopoly on news agent, or, 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 or news is, is, is lethal for your language. The French and the British, and also the Italians, the Belgians, the Germans, then went on to carve Africa in their own names and to teach Africans their own languages. There were different attitudes by the different colonial powers as to how much you should teach Africans their own languages. And of course, after World War II ended and the Axis it, it lost, the territories that used to be Italian and that used to be German eventually became French or became uh, 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 English. And Africa then became carved up into roughly Francophone nations and Anglophone nations. They still have an incredible variety of local languages that Africa has always had. There's probably no other continent that has more variety, more linguistic variety than Africa. Swahili emerged as a kind of lingua franca during the 19th century precisely because as, as transportation made mobility between different parts of Africa more, more possible and more feasible and cheaper, you needed some kind of lingua franca, so Swahili eventually emerged as that. But the official language, language that you would switch codes to speak to the judge, you would switch codes to speak to the police, you would switch codes to write a letter to the government, was either French or English. And to this day, and, and you can check this by just going and checking the voting records of the UN, Francophone African nations vote as a bloc, typically in the same way that France votes, and Anglophone nations of Africa vote with Britain and the United States. Which means that linguistic colonialism paid off, right? I mean, it, it actually, you know, there, there was a reward at the end of that. Now, the battle between the, the, two, the two standards continued. French was winning all the way to World War I, I mean, all the way to World War II. If you were a Russian pilot of a plane in, say, the 1930s, and you wanted to land your plane in Greece, you would not speak to the tower in Greek, and you would not speak to the tower in Russian. You would speak to the tower in French. And it was, of course, also the language of diplomacy. If you were from, from, a, from a place that they spoke neither one of those two languages, you showed up at a diplomatic meeting and spoke French. After the Nazis humiliated French, that was one of the main reasons, but there were other reasons, English finally manages to edge up a little bit, and it has now managed to become the international standard. But again, the French were the international standard for 250 years. English has only been the international standard for 50 years. 
So let's not get carried away and believe that you finally won the fight. For all I care, in 20 years from now, you know, text, you know, kind of, kind of some kind of version of text English with all the vowels taken out and, you know, OMG for, oh my God, you know, <laughs> has now become the new standard. Languages continue changing. But the most important change that happened to this, to this and this is what, how I want to finish the class, is what happened to these two frozen languages when they were imposed on this, the African slaves from slave plantations. Slave plantations, of course, are not communities. They are artificial collocations of people with a sex ratio completely, completely uh, in favor of males, so they cannot have any kind of real community life. And the, and the people who bought slaves were aware of the wide diversity of, of, of dialects in Africa and in many, on purpose bought slaves from different linguistic backgrounds. Why? So they could not be able to communicate with each other. If you're going to organize a rebellion in a plantation, if you're going to organize an uprising, you need to communicate. But if you get them from all kinds of different linguistic backgrounds, they cannot communicate. So your typical slave plantation, and I'm only going to consider here uh, Jamaica, uh, Jamaican English, <coughs> the birth of Jamaican English in, in, in Jamaican plantations, and the birth of Haitian French in Haiti, or in plantations in Haiti. In those plantations, the slaves were forced to invent their own language. The process through which they invented a new language is called pigeonization. Which basically means a super simplification. Pigeons are language typical, your typical pigeon are very if, 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 ephemeral languages that exist whenever there is a contact situation between cultures with very, very different, different linguistic backgrounds. For instance, in those great bazaars in the Levant where the Venetians were to trade and then the Genoese went to trade and then the Portuguese went to trade, a pigeon emerged which was part Arabic, part Venetian when the Venetians were the main customers, and it became part Portuguese when the Portuguese were the main customers. Pigeons are extremely simplified versions of a language that are only necessary to, I mean, that are good only for the most basic necessities. To, to, to say, well, I want to buy three, not at this price, but at this price, or I want to exchange three of this for two of those. And pigeons are so ephemeral that they disappear the moment the contact situation disappears. So if a particular trading situation lasts for 300 years, a pigeon would evolve and develop for 300 years, but the moment trade between those two cultures stops, the pigeon itself disappears. In slave plantations, on the other hand, a, a very different process uh, 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 it occurred. The slaves themselves, in their, in, their, in their need to survive not only the horrible conditions of the slave plantation, but just in, the, in their need to try to create some semblance of community and some semblance of their own local culture, began simplifying the language of the master. English in the case of Jamaican plantations, French in the case of Haitian, Haitian. What's the matter with my spelling today? And they, they did a fantastic job particularly considering the circumstances that under, under which they were laboring and the very small amount of time they had to be thinking about linguistic matters, they in fact managed to create a pidgin English and a pidgin French in a few decades. The masters, of course, when they heard this, this, this new language that being spoke, was being spoken by the slaves, thought it was broken English or broken French or retard English or retard French. They really put it down. They never understood the incredible creative act that it is to be living in those conditions and to manage to, you know, get rid of the verb to be, for instance, to get rid of a bunch of other verbs that are normally not necessary and create a very compact, very simplified pigeon that is nevertheless enough 
for communication. When those slaves were freed, the first few generations of freed slaves and their kids create another process called creolization. Creolization is a re-enrichment. And via creolization, which can happen in a whole variety of ways, you can re-enrich a pigeon by borrowing from foreign languages. In, in one particular case, a Hawaiian English, it, it, the main scholar, whose name I can't remember right now, who's the, name, the main scholar of Hawaiian Creole, claims that it was in fact children over three generations that re-enriched the pigeon. Why? Because children, when they are like five, six years old, love to invent new languages, not to invent new words. And if their parents are not comfortable telling them, hey, don't use that word, that's not a word of the standard. Don't use that word, you're going to sound like a vulgar person. If there's no a parents exerting authority and, 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 and the order word, you know, the power of the order word is not there, then children begin inventing new words, they begin to be adopted by the parents, never, never really cared about being correct, you know, linguistically, because that was the, la the last of their, of their preoccupations. So a language becomes enriched and becomes a real new version of English. Jamaican English is not broken English, it's not inferior English, it's a new species of English. Haitian French is not broken French, it's a new, valid and legitimate new species of French. And the same thing, of course, for Black American English. Black American English also emerged through pigeonization and creolization, and as William Labov was the first one to demonstrate, when you analyze the grammar, the formal grammar of Black English, it is every bit as systematic and every bit as coherent as the grammar of Standard English. So the idea that Black English is somehow an inferior form of English is today.